I've made this comment at every, the beginning of every class when I show this slide, and today is no exception, that it is extremely important for all of us in the entertainment industry to remember that just because there are rules, regulations, standards, organizations out there who are, are dealing with safety aspects and, and, and guidance documents and, and all of that sort of stuff, that very, very little of it, very little of it, especially stuff from the outside world, is written with the entertainment industry in mind. There is, um, we are a very small industry, although bigger than I think we realized. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of red buildings of weight popping up around. But um, we're a small industry, and especially government, government organizations like OSHA um, do not address issues specific to the entertainment industry. Um, their, their mission is to protect workers on a more general basis. And they will do some specific stuff for some industries uh, where it's warranted, but not so much for us. Um, this, as far as I'm concerned, is not a bad thing. Thank you, David. Chris Wallace. See, that's why I was having trouble. Um, so we're going to talk about regulations, rules, and standards, because I, you need to know that they exist, and you need to know that what, what, what their uh, focus is and how to deal with them. But remember at the same time that most of what we do, um, we're kind of on our own. And um, which at least from my standpoint is a good thing. I, I, I personally, I like that. So here's, here are the references. Um, NFP 80 is the life safety code. It deals with um, the section that, that is pertinent to our industry, deals with fire, uh, fire doors. And um, they do address, excuse me, they do address um, proscenium fire safety curtains in that, um, in that standard, in that standard NFP 80, I believe it's section. 20, but it may have changed since the last iteration came around. But um, uh, the standard that is more pertinent, is more specifically written for the entertainment industry, comes from the entertainment industry. And we'll get into that later. So as the title of this class is, says, we're talking about regulations, rules, and standards. Um, it's important to know where they come from and what you have to do with them. And I think that, uh, you know, I think that, that that's hopefully clear. I want to just make a comment on the standards when I, I've got the little asterisk going there, which is, but are they really? And, are standards really voluntary? Is that a true statement? Uh, and here in the United States, uh, which is what we're working with today, we are working with US reg rules, regulations, and standards. Um, standards are voluntary. You don't have to follow them at all if you choose so. If you choose not to follow them, that's your, your up to you. However, if a standard exists, at the time that you are do, doing something and you screw it up, and you do not, and you, you screwed it up because you did, because you did not, because you did not follow, you did not follow that, that standard, uh, be it an ANSI standard or uh, you know an NFPA or uh, national NFPA, by the way, is National Fire Protection Association, or the NEC, for example, the National Electrical Code. Those documents, by nature, by the nature of how they were. Um, conceived and written will have the force of law in court and as I think most of us know uh, <laughs> the US is a bit of a litigious society and um, when you get a wrongful death or a wrongful injury or even a 
you know, you, 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 you knock down a, a big building or something, you know, you cause a lot of property damage. When they end up in court in the civil cases, uh, the judgments that come out in civil cases are extraordinary. And um, so while ANSI standards and their compatriots are voluntary in nature, and it says so on the, on the documents, you don't have to follow them. Um, you don't want to screw up, otherwise you could uh, land yourself in a world of trouble. We have a, a session, though, I think, if I remember correctly, it's the last session on, uh, in, this, in this series at the end of October, which is dealing with standards. Um, so I'm not going to try, I'm going to try not to step on that too much today, um, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Okay. So we want to talk about regulations first. Um, let me let me back up for just before we get into the regulations. Let me let me give you uh, a bit of an idea of why uh, this. I mean, I thought why I thought that we were going to do this class and how I thought how it turned in a different direction is what I'm trying to say and not doing so well at it. Um, for a number of reasons, the industry, the entertainment industry is facing a situation where compliance is going to have to be, it's going to become more important. It's going to become more required. Uh, it's not that it's going to be more required, excuse me, it's going to be more enforced. And um, it's going to be, for those who don't understand the regulations and the compliance components of those regulations, it's going to be harder to find work. It's going to be harder to, 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 to get on a job site, for example. Um, and you know it's going to make your life a little bit more miserable. So I wanted, I realized that one of the things that I wanted to do today was point out that you know why we need to know what the OSHA regulations are, what the basic regulations are, um, um, so that we can be prepared for them. Um, you know, my original thought for doing this, or one of my original thoughts for doing this class was because on, in, in our industry, on site, you know, load ins, load outs, that sort of thing. Um, you know, there's always a lot of talk from the technicians on the site. And at least I hear it anyway, I hear, you know, well, you gotta do this because it's a wall, or you gotta do this other thing because, you know, they said, you know, the rules say you have to do that. Um, and for the most part, most people are only partially right. You know, they get, they get like the, 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 the statement half right, or maybe mostly right, but for all the wrong reasons. And I just wanted to clarify and, you know, take some of the confusion out of that. Because as I say, I think it's going to become more difficult. Um, I, do, I don't do touring anymore. Uh, we do a lot of new installation work, a lot of renovation work um, in what I guess is, can, can be considered a more, con more traditional construction site situation. And what we have been seeing over the last three to four years as an, is an enormous uptick in the requirements for being able to work on the site. You know, having various OSHA, you know, OSHA 10, OSHA 30 cards, um, you know, lift, uh, lift training certificates, um, not only lift, but forklift, personnel lift, you know, uh, scaffolding. Scaffolding certificates have, be, have become a huge deal. And, um, you, know, you know, you need to be aware that they exist and you need to know how to handle them. Now, they haven't filtered down as much, and please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, especially those of you who, um, uh, who did have done touring over the last you know, two or three years, but, um, but uh, uh, it hasn't 
filtered it down, these requirements have not filtered down into the entertainment industry as much as they have, say, in the construction industry. However, I think because of what we are seeing as a result of COVID-19, the pandemic, I think that these requirements, these certifications, this awareness of, for lack of a better term at the moment, paperwork that needs to be handled under the guise, it's, it's going to uh, permeate into our industry more and more quickly. Um, with COVID-19, you can't, you, you know, I can't go anywhere. I can't go into any uh, school building. I can't go into any municipal building without, um, without coming up against requirements that frankly are all over the map at the moment. Um, that, uh, you, know, you know, you have to have a COVID safety plan, a company-wide COVID safety plan that addresses, and they're looking for that plan to address not only site-specific situations, but also the corporate uh, situation. You know, if I've got people going on site to do an installation in a, in a college, for example, the college wants to see um, the, the safety, the COVID safety plan for the school, for what we are going to do when we get to that building. But they also want to know what our safety plan is for back at the shop. Because they figure we have to have a plan for the shop and that's got to, you know, roll over into the, um, the plan for, the, for the, uh, uh, the work we're doing in the school. All this is to say that, you know, I think we need to be prepared, or at least better prepared, for a higher level of paperwork, a higher level of safety awareness requirements as we move forward and hopefully get out of this pandemic in a little while. Um, all right, hold on a second here. Tyler, let me see what you've got to say here. And as for some employers, but not others, for example, Um, yeah, Feld is, is, is indeed on top of certifications, but they don't have any employees at the moment, um, as I understand it anyway. I think everybody is, uh, has been furloughed, uh, everybody I know. Um, so this goes beyond just you know, ETCP certifications or various um, entertainment industry companies, you know, certifications for, for uh, uh, lighting systems or, or rigging systems, ETC and that sort of thing. It goes much beyond that. And we need to be aware of it. So let's just talk about the regulations here briefly. And um, I thought this was a pretty good way to start off. Uh, and as I was doing my research, um, you know, when I was looking for, the, I, I knew the quote, but I wanted to make sure I got it all right. So I, I Googled it up and I started reading about it. And apparently most attorneys feel that this is a, um, a positive statement. That it is something that uh, uh, ultimately, given the context of the, of, the, of the show, of the play, puts them in a good light. I'll leave you to make that decision on your own. Um, the reason I put it up, is because uh, OSHA has lots and lots of regulations. And how do I put this politely? The best people, I think, who have been able to interpret OSHA regulations have been the attorneys who work with the various, you know, with, with companies, construction companies and that sort of thing, who, uh, who run into OSHA regulations uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, I need to go back to my original statement about regulations that have not been written for us and remind you that, that, that this is a true thing that, you know, as we'll see in a minute, you know, there are some regulations that apply to us, but haven't been written to us. I haven't said, you know, you must do this when you're, you know, you know, walking on a catwalk in a, uh, in a high school theater. I mean, they don't get that specific by any stretch of the imagination. 
Um, so not only are we left to cherry pick the rules and regulations that, um, that OSHA has written and find the ones that are applicable to us, but we also have to understand that for the most part, the OSHA rules and regulations are open for inter interpretation on a legal on the legal side, you'll have lawyers who will fight on both sides of, of, of a, a, an OSHA regulation. And, you know, that kind of depends on the day of the week and what phase the moon is in, um, which way it will go. It's not nearly as cut and dried as we'd like to think. I do not want to turn this session into a legal discussion if we can avoid it, but if we need to, to go down that, that, that very torturous path, um, we can do that. I want to start off with this statement because it is a classic general statement that OSHA makes. And, and well, I, I have to apologize here. This statement is within the OSHA regulations. It is in, uh, within the documents uh, that um, that OSHA has put together. And I've had it for quite some time. And you know, when I first took it out of the OSHA regulation, I foolishly did not copy the regulation number. And I have not been able to find it since. Uh, I, 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 I spent a lot of time yesterday trying to find this document. So I could give you the actual document number. Uh, I can tell you it's within the 1926 code, but I can't tell you where at the moment because I haven't been able to find it. Um, so those of you who are bored silly and are now looking for it, I, I wish you all the best of luck. One of the reasons that I started, I, I wanted to do this class was to try and straighten out people's thoughts on how, you know, what, we, what it is we are supposed to be doing to be safe on a work site. Um, and to use equipment properly and that sort of thing. OSHA is the, the, the worker safety program. So while we talk about OSHA, which I hope will be brief, um, we, will, um, we will be talking about safety aspects of it. Uh, once we get into the manufacturers and standards, then we can talk about more of the operational things. Um, okay, so. All right. One of the things that I hear about on site a lot, and this is just one small example. Um, you know, people talk about eyewear, safety glasses, and hard hats. And they talk about it in the sense that, you know, there are, there's only a limited uh, need and for very specific locations uh, in the theater. And I wanna try and dispel that, just let people understand that this is not true. Um, OSHA's requirement is very broad and, you know, and specific at the same time. If you can hurt yourself, if you, if you have the ability to smack your head into something, you're supposed to be wearing a hard hat. If you're working in an area where you, somebody can drop something on your head, you need to be wearing a hard hat. And you know, I would ask you, what area, hang on a second. You, you never cease to amaze me, Sarah. So you found that. Thank you. <laughs> it's not part of the uh, regulation. It's a, sort of a disclaimer. Right. Okay. That's probably why I couldn't find it. Um, is it in one of the interpretations? So anyway, going back to the, to get to the hard hat, and I'm just using a hard hat as an example here. You know, if you, got, if you can hit your head or if somebody can drop something on your head, um, you have to have a hard hat. Tell me in what situation, and I'm, I mean this, if, if you've got an idea of what situation 
when um, you're doing a load in, whether it's a theatrical load in, you know, on stage, uh, some of us remember those, um, or, you know, setting up you know, a concert, an outdoor concert, you know. At what point are you in a situation um, where you are completely free from any worry about having something smack you in the head? I get people telling me all the time that they don't have to wear a hard hat when they're in the high steel at an arena, for example. I don't know about you, but I, I, I can't count the number of times, and you'd think I would have learned, but I can't count the number of times that I smacked my head into an overhead obstruction while walking along a beam, um, walking inside a, you know, the big architectural structural roof truss um, that um, you know, the downtown armory was classic for uh, in New York City. Places like that where you're walking along and you have the ability to smack your head. You smack your head, you got the ability to knock yourself out or at least disorient yourself. Um, and then you have the ability to fall. I know this all sounds trivial, I suspect, but there are enough people out there who still believe that, you know, the rules either don't apply to them or that the rules are, you know, more um, specific, that they don't apply to theatrical applications, for example. Um, it's not true. And if something happens, if you get hurt or you hurt somebody else and somebody seeks legal recourse, the, you know, there are repercussions for you, uh, for you not following those rules and regulations excuse me, the regulations. Um, you have to know them, you have to, and, and you've got to at least remember if you're going to break a regulation, you got to know that you're breaking a regulation so that you can act accordingly. Okay, I know this sounds all like common sense, but you know. Um, trying to think of this, you know, um, uh, eyewear is, is a particular uh, pet peeve of mine. Uh, having had problems with uh, eye injuries over the years that were specifically related to theatrical applications. Um, you know, eyewear is, you know, anytime you're in an, in, in, an, in an industrial application and people are working around you, you know, you got people working overhead on the grid, for example. You know, they're gonna be knocking off. Nobody goes up there and sweeps or vacuums a grid. It, it stays <laughs> only reasonably clean because people are up there rubbing the dirt off and knocking it down to the floor where you are. Um, eyewear will help protect you on that one. All right, excuse me for one second here. Recommend the practices. How did you guys find it so quickly? I could not find it to save my life. Well, thank you for that. Say again, Sarah. I'm very good at finding things. Okay. Okay, so here's an interesting situation. And this goes into, um, I mean, if, unless you have, you know, some other safety aspects of the regulations, you know, that are more specific, um, what I was trying to do with this is impart the understanding that there's a lot out there and you need to be aware of it. Um, and if you're not going to follow it, you have to take the necessary precautions that, um, that, you know, following the, the regulation would have, you know, taken care of for you. Um, so if you have specific, whoop, there's one from, does 1910 have a head protection regulation? Um, I believe it does, I don't know. And, and we're throwing the gauntlet down at Sarah once again. Um, 1926 certainly does, and that's the one that I stopped at because at this stage of the game, for this pur the purposes of this class, we are talking primarily about the construction code and not the industrial code. Um, and David Glowacki says, yes, exclamation point. 
Um, and I suppose this, I should do a bunny trail here for a moment and explain that OSHA has uh, two sets of regulations. Well, they got more, but the, the two primary ones that we're looking talking about are the 1926 code and the 1910 code. 1910 um, references industrial applications. Um, 1926 uh, references construction applications. This can be very confusing and this could also take the rest of the session just to talk about this, but to give you a, a, a rough idea of, of how that affects the entertainment industry. If you are doing a load in, whether it's a theatrical application or you know, a, a concert arena, whatever, during the load and unloading the trucks, bringing the gear in, setting it up, that's all part of the construction code. So you would follow the rules and regulations within the construction code. Um, once you are done doing that, however, and you go into rehearsal mode, then you would switch over to the industrial side of things and you would follow the regulations in 1910 and you would follow those regulations right up to, um, and the end of the performance. And then as you and your colleagues go to start taking things apart to strike the show, um, you would switch back over to 1926. So 1910 and 1926 have different requirements. They have different uh, specifications. Um, and you know, I don't want to get into all that today because it's going to take a while. The biggest one um, that usually comes up in entertainment, the entertainment industry is the fall, allowable fall distance. 1910, under most circumstances, uh, allows for only a four foot fall while 1926, the construction code in most circumstances allows for a six foot fall. Um, I will tell you, however, that it's not cut and dry with OSHA, it never is. Um, you have rules and regulations, you have regulations, I keep saying that, I apologize, you have regulations that um, OSHA will leave the interpretation of those regulations in a site-specific situation up to the investigating agent uh, or agents. And, um, you know, they'll have you know, free reign to a certain extent to interpret the regulations as they see fit per that situation, per that event. As an example, it's gone back a couple of years now, but a young uh, performer was in rehearsal in Vegas uh, doing a silk act and you know in a rehearsal space and uh, you know they were set up you know it was set up properly I mean it was it was a, a regular space it wasn't somebody's living room or anything and um, she took a fall she came down uh, she came off the silk and um, you know hit the, the matting on the floor um, was injured and severely injured, but as I understand it, made a full recovery, fortunately, uh, and, went, and went back to performing. OSHA did their investigation, and this was a rehearsal. And clearly, according to the, in, the interpretations that OSHA has put out over the years, this was a, a 1910 code situation. It was a rehearsal, an industrial situation. Um, the investigators used and stated in their report that they were using the 1926 construction code. Why? I don't know. Uh, so that just complicates matters and allows uh, for my comment that I use in my classes a lot that interpretations of OSHA regulations are usually dependent upon what the investigator had for breakfast that morning. Okay. So it's a complicated situation. I can't make it any less complicated. I can only tell you, you need to be aware of it. If you are, uh, if you are in a management position, you need to investigate this so that you are, you know, making sure that you are doing all of the things that you're supposed to be doing and making sure that your staff, your employees, uh, your technicians, they're all doing what they are supposed to be doing. Um, technicians, you need to be following the rules too, and you, know, you need to 
keep your, your management folks honest and making sure that, um, that they're doing what they're supposed to do. I am not suggesting that you go home and, and sit down with the, the Federal Register and read OSHA. Um, <laughs> not unless you're having difficulty sleeping. Uh, it's a wonderful sleep aid. But um, from time to time, when something comes up, I think it's incumbent upon all of us, if we're not sure about what, you know, if we don't have the exact um, understanding of that particular situation, that we, we look it up. I mean, we have Google and we have the ability to do that. I wanted to bring up this OSHA toolbox talks concept here for a couple minutes because number one, I think it's extremely important. I think it's a great idea. It's not a regulation per se. OSHA recommends that people do this, but they haven't come out yet, to my understanding anyway, and said, you must do this. Um, what they do is they recommend it and they give you a lot of information on how to do this. And I, you know, I suspect many of you have already um, either participated in or at least have an understanding of the toolbox talk concept. Uh, but for the others, um, this is, uh, for lack of a better word, it's a meeting. It is a gathering of the people involved in a particular project before the project gets started. Typically, first thing in the morning, but could be the day before. I mean, it depends on the circumstances. But it is a meeting where all of the players, all the people who are involved in that particular situation, a load in, in an arena, for example, all the upriggers get together with the, you know, the road rigger or the house guy, whoever is, is in charge and whoever is going to be directing activities that day. And they talk about what they need to do, what the job is, what it's going to take to get the job done safely. Uh, and talk about at least, you know, you know, not in detail, but at least in, in brief about what to do should something go wrong. You know, some kind of an accident happen in, in, in a high steel would be, you know, typically it would be talking about what to do if somebody takes a header off the steel and you got to go rescue them. Um, these are extraordinarily this, I mean, this concept is an extraordinarily good idea, and in my experience, not one that has made it, uh, at least not significantly, into the entertainment industry, and I believe that it should. Um, it's extraordinarily helpful to have everybody know what's going on. You know, the upriggers, the ground riggers, the carpenters, the electricians, they can all have their own separate meetings, or you can have one big group group if, you, if, if that's what works for that particular um, uh, situation, that particular event. As I said, OSHA is highly recommending this. They are providing um, lots of forms, templates, where you can fill out the toolbox, you know, you can design the toolbox talk, and then you can make notes about how it went and what the aftermath was, you know, what kind of reactions you got from people. They put a lot of effort into this. And I think it's a very worthwhile thing. I also think, going to the legal side of things, because OSHA has recommended this and because they have put a significant amount of effort into uh, providing information to, to help you do this kind of, uh, this, this toolbox talk thing, then, um, you know, if you're not doing it and something goes wrong, there's a lawyer somewhere who's going to pick up on that and it's going to create a problem for you. I don't like to use that as the, as the big stick or anything, but uh, because I think that this is a great idea and, and every, all, we all should be doing this. Um, but if, if, you know, efficiency and safety aren't good enough reasons, you know, having a lawyer grilling you on a witness stand uh, isn't any fun at all and you do want to avoid that. And then let's wander over here to David's. Um, pardon me, David is talking about uh, letters of interpretation. 
the letters, in, you know, and, and what David is referring to is, and these are written documents that you find on the OSHA website, um, and they are extremely helpful um, because they will be talking about specific situations. Somebody will write in and say that, you know, they've got this particular situation and they're trying to follow this particular regulation, but they don't know how to do it. And OSHA will respond and give an interpretation of that regulation in theory to be helpful to the person asking the question. Um, I do use the um, letters of interpretation regularly as my, my way of you know, sorting out you know, what OSHA really means by one of their thou shalt or thou shalt nots. Thank you for that, David. So toolbox talks I think are a big deal and um, I would highly recommend them. <sighs> Another uh, program that I would highly recommend and has become um, extremely uh, important, again, on construction sites, we run into this all the time now, um, not only on just a regular old you know, school construction site, municipal construction sites, event construction sites, um, where they are requiring the people who are working on site to have OSHA 10 and more and more and more an OSHA 30 card. And OSHA 10 and OSHA, OSHA uh, 30 are training programs that, uh, and they get their name because in theory, that's how long it takes to, uh, to, 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 to take the class uh, online. And, uh, and then, you know, and pass the exam and get your card. Uh, it's not true, OSHA 10, it's gonna take a little longer than that. OSHA 30, you know, I, I know people, who it, it's taken them 40 hours. Um, not straight, of course, but you, you get to take a nap every once in a while. Again, I'm making you aware of this because it is going to become, I firmly believe, it is going to become more, the requirement more and more as we move from the pandemic in, back into whatever our lives are gonna look like uh, after, you know, post pandemic, um, you know, partially fueled by the things that we have to do during the pandemic. And, you know, the understanding that insurance companies and lawyers and municipalities and organizations are gonna see what they had to do during the pandemic. And they're gonna carry that through into the next phase of our lives, whatever that ultimately ends up looking like. Um, you can read it. I don't, I don't need to, 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 to read it off the screen. Um, I do want to point out that OSHA, that uh, Nevada is the only state so far. Um, I would not be surprised if within the next two or three years, um, a number of states, especially those who have um, uh, large performing arts communities, you know, states with, with large cities, New York, Pennsylvania, California, Illinois. Um, I'm not sure Vermont's going to jump on board that quickly, but eh, you never know. Um, it's, just, it's one of those things that I would like you to be aware of. Uh, there are OSHA 10 classes that, I mean, all of the OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 classes, as it says there, are general industry or the construction course. However, um, OSHA and various organizations within the entertainment industry, in particular, uh, the State Chance Union, the IA, have gotten together and helped uh, have worked out a tweaked kind of program where, you know, a regular OSHA 10 class for general industry isn't going to have much to do with what we do. It's going to be general industry and it's not going to be about pushing boxes up a ramp, as, you know, or, or hanging lights or any of that sort of thing. Uh, and the same is true for, you know, a construction OSHA 10 or the OSHA 30 program. But they have worked out a program for the entertainment industry 
that incorporates a significant amount of entertainment industry information along with the general industry and construction stuff that OSHA already requires of these classes. Um, I think that you're gonna need these as, as we move forward. Uh, I think you need to, to start investigating and, and seeing what they're about. Uh, and I would also highly recommend that you search out for the, um, uh, the instructors, the programs that are working with the more entertainment industry based OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 classes. Now let's go back over to the chat here for a second. David Simpson is asking, whoop, David, sorry about that. Uh, if you already have an OSHA 30 general industry, do you re recommend getting the OSHA 30 construction card? You know, I don't, I, I, I couldn't tell you that, David. I think that, you know, um, Murphy's Law will come into play here and you'll decide not to do that. You know, you'll just keep your OSHA 30 general industry card and then you'll walk on a site where, rightly or wrongly, the management of that site is, is now asking for an OSHA 30 construction card, you know? Having them both, while, you know, a royal pain to get um, is not a bad idea, but I can't say whether it, um, uh, it, will, it will satisfy, you know, having the, just the general industry will satisfy everybody. All right, lots of, class, lots of questions here. Um, so from Scott Oliver. Um, I, the IATSE Training Trust Fund offers um, this, the, the OSHA 10 class that is um, entertainment industry based. Yes, that's true. Norman, same, uh, Norman asks about 30 construction versus OSHA 30 industry. And um, yeah, I have the same, the same answer I gave David. Um, it's gonna be situational. Um, you, can, you can roll the dice on that one and just keep the one card and hope that it works for every site that you get on. But there is no, um, there's no, po there's no police enforcement of which card that I, you know, there's nobody out there saying that, you know, you have to have this particular card for this kind of a site. Um, primarily, which card you are required to have is determined by, either you know the general contractor or the insurance company of the promoter or the producer you know um so they're going to pick the one that they think is appropriate and that may or may not be the one that you have um judy is saying that local aid is currently offering free osha 10 classes good for them thank you very much um, Camille, once again, excellent question. And I will admit, I don't know the answer. Camille asks if we need an OSHA 10 before getting an OSHA 30. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and David, David Golowacki, and I'm hoping that somebody who has, uh, who has done this uh, recently. Yes. I have my OSHA 10, but I don't have my OSHA 30. This is Dave Glowicki, and yes, you can. Uh, you do have to get the 10 before the 30. Um, if you make the decision to extend within six months of getting your 10, those 10 hours can apply to the 30, and then you only have to sit through 20 more hours. Uh, if, if that six month calendar has expired, then you have to start over with 30 hours to get that 30 card. Right. Uh, unfortunately, and I'm not suggesting um, this is me putting my Chris Wallace hat on here for a moment. Uh, but David, I think you need to have a conversation with Norman. Um, and I don't know the answer, so I'm going to let you two guys hash it out. Uh, but Norman is saying that he got his OSHA 30 before he got his OSHA 10. Um, I don't have that answer. Okay. At the end of the day,
And that David Simpson's got it, yeah. So David is, it looks like David Simpson and, da and Norman are, um, in a, are agreeing with each other that an OSHA, third, OSHA 10 is not required before um, an OSHA 10. So David, somebody took your money. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you, David. He rechecked. He's he's issuing a new statement. All right, take, let, let, let's 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 kind of move on here. What time is it? Ay ay ay. Okay. Um. You know, there is a couple of of, of key items in this class, and and this is one of them. Um, Documentation is extremely important for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that you as an individual, if you are writing stuff down that has happened or that is about to happen, you know, you know, um, you know in your log books, you know, training classes, you know, yeah, inspection, uh, in, in, inspection dates and that sort of thing. What it's saying is that you're paying attention. And it's saying that you're focusing on the work that you need to do and you're focusing on the gear that you need to do that work. And you're making uh, a significant attempt at having the right gear and taking care of it and taking care of yourself and thereby taking care of the people around you. Um, and that is, you know, <laughs> that, that's just the name of the game. Um, that writing down, you know, means that you're paying attention and you're keeping track. A lot of us have gear that, you know, if we hadn't written down the serial number and the date of purchase of that harness, yeah, we wouldn't remember because, you know, we've had it for a while. I've got a harness hanging up in the in the vestibule of my uh, uh, back home on the on the coat rack, and you know. I couldn't, you know, just looking at it, I couldn't tell you how old it was other than knowing that it ain't new by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I can go to the serial number and I can go to my log book and I can, it will tell me how old it is, when it was manufactured. Now, yes, before you throw, throw it up on the chat, harnesses do come with date of manufacture on the labels, at least they're supposed to. I was using it as an example, okay? The other reason that documentation is extremely important are the legal side of things. Um, if there's an incident and OSHA is brought onto the scene, the first thing they are going to ask for, and I mean this, the first thing they're going to ask for is the paperwork. Now, if you have the paperwork, and you're able to provide that paperwork to them, you just made their lives easier. Making an ocean investigator's life easier is a very good thing. If you don't have that paperwork, now their lives are more difficult and that's gonna make it more difficult for you. And at the end of the day, if this is a serious enough situation that it ends up in court, in a civil court, after the OSHA investigation is concluded, it's just gonna make your life that much more difficult. All right, I'm not gonna belabor the point. You really all, all of you who are working in the industry, who have um, equipment that you need to use, I'm not talking about your hand tools, but you know, fall arrest equipment, for example, people who are managing a shop, manage a theater, manage an arena, whatever equipment that you have, you should have documentation on that gear. You should have documentation on all of the training that you are, you're, 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 you're either you're getting or that you're, uh, you're providing for your, your staff and employees. You can't document too much. It's just, it's just not possible. And once again, OSHA provides you know, a number of templates. You don't have to follow them if you don't like them. Um, you know, for all, I think most of 
the, the documentation that we provide for our fall rescue is we've came up with our own template because we like putting our name on it rather than putting OSHA's name on it. All right, okay. Moving right along. Oh, let's talk about rules. We're gonna do this, what do we got? Half an hour left? Yeah. Yeah, this is going. Okay, rules. Sorry, I jumped the gun there. I gave it away. Um, so now we're talking about manufacturers. Manufacturers make rules for how you are to use their equipment. That is how to use it and equally important, how not to use their equipment. And you know, we don't always follow those rules. Uh, as I've always said, the entertainment industry, a big, big component in this industry is that we break the rules. We break the rules regularly, but it's really ex extremely important to know what rules you're breaking when you are breaking them so that you can break them with confidence that you're not going to create a hazardous condition. All right. So I'm going to use, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use, oh, thank you, Sarah. I'm going to use uh, chain hoists as an example. And I'm using CM because it is the product, at least here in the US, that I think more people are familiar with than anyone else. Right. And it's a pretty good example. So I'm going to show you this. And don't make yourself crazy trying to read it because it's, it's a challenge. Uh, I've got the, we'll get to the next slide. But I want to point out that this is page three on the owner's manual of a CM Lodestar chain hoist. Doesn't matter what size, what model Lodestar it is. This is page three. And it goes through a whole lot of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts, as you can see there, okay? So I've taken out a couple of them that I think are pretty important to what we do. And um, I made them so you could read them. I'm letting you read them. I'm particularly fond of the last one. When you're running a chain hoist and they come in and, the, and, and someone comes in to on the other end of the room carrying a tray full of coffee and they yell coffee, you're not supposed to go get coffee while you're still running the chain hoist. You're supposed to finish that job and then go get the coffee, okay? Uh, what can I say? So assuming that you have read this, we break all of these rules. These are rules that CM Columbus McKinnon has put in their owner's manual. These are mandatory. I should point out that one of the things that OSHA says, and it says it quite clearly, when in doubt, follow manufacturer's specifications. So not only when you break a rule from a manufacturer, you're also breaking a rule at OSHA. So they got you coming and going. I am not going to suggest for a moment that we stop breaking the rules. I need to remind you that these rules exist for a reason. And when we break those rules, we need to pay attention. We need to make sure that we have done everything we can possibly do to mitigate any kind of, of uh, potential hazardous condition. Uh, you know. uh, the one in the middle, do not leave load supported by the hoist unattended unless specific precautions have been taken. That's right out of the manual. What they don't say is what those specific precautions are. And the reason they, they don't do that is because they don't want to limit um, themselves from a legal standpoint. Um, uh, and they also don't want people not using their equipment. Because they know that, you know, especially in the entertainment industry, we, we, we leave our loads unattended all the time. Now, I think we've got some, um, some, some folks on this call from across the pond in Europe, and it is much more common, although, and it's not always, 
but it is much more common to see a chain hoist rig in the air with secondary safeties put on those on those chain hoists or on on the uh, uh, on the rig excuse me um it's not common here at all i don't know anybody who does it at least certainly not regularly um if 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 you you know want to tell us about a story that they do it over here please let, let us know but you know we routinely routinely uh tyler thank you so feld um put secondaries on their on their um on their their rigs is it is the secondary to the hoist usually tyler or is the secondary the the, the safety uh down to uh, the rig the safety on everything over see everything over the audience uh all speakers all lighting trusses everything like that and also they'll do it on their mother grids when they do a mother grid for an ice show right my question is where does that what does that safety attach to does it attach to the lifting mechanism or to the to the piece being lifted uh, it attaches to the piece being lifted they take the motor completely out of it okay excellent uh, do they leave do they leave um, uh, some tension on the hoist um, thereby making the secondary the safety a true secondary so that the primary support is still the hoist and the secondary is there as a backup or how i don't want to put you on a spot too much here <laughs> uh no that's fine uh yeah they always leave the tension on the motor uh right. generally speaking if you look at the safeties you can see some slack on them um right. what i usually tell upriggers or told upriggers when i was working for feld is make it as pretty as possible but you're not picking anything up with this right one of the one of the cautions uh, thank you thank you for that tyler um and paul taylor where, where did you go oh, there you are paul yeah you're backing up if you'll pardon the pun uh, my comment about uh, about europe um, um they will insist on secondaries but although you know i go to to trade shows it, well, I went to trade shows in uh, in Europe regularly, and um, it was not it was not common in a trade show to see a secondaries. Um, certainly not not in London. They did it at Earl's Court, but unfortunately, Earl's Court has gone away. All right, James, thank you. Um, excellent. So one of the things to keep in mind with this is that this is a rule um, and this is the way that you are you know applying that rule to our application by putting on a secondary however if you put a secondary you put a safety on and it's a one-ton hoist and you're using a piece of 3 8 steel sling as a safety which is certainly adequate but you have five feet of slack in that safety it's no longer a safety. It's not going to survive the shock load should the primary, the hoist fail and the load is allowed to fall five feet. That 3 8 steel sling is not going to provide um, uh, safety. It's not going to, it's not going to catch the falling load. It will, it will fail. Um, so, you know, you've got to take steps to resolve the, 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 issue and follow the rules, but you got to take them in a manner that actually does follow the rules. If we have time today, we'll talk about steel flag slings and how that problem came about um, and how it was resolved. But that's not something I want to get to. I got other stuff first. So here's another one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here in this, this statement, which I took off of probably Liftall's um, um, website, but I, wanted, I didn't want to be you know, company specific. They all say the same thing. You got to protect from sharp edges. They all talk about the load. Now, we don't work that way typically, when we, especially when we're talking about a steel sling. You know, we're not wrapping the load with a steel sling. We're wrapping the building structure in some manner. 
we still have to protect the, uh, uh, the, the, the sling from the sharp edges. And just because they don't say it in that statement doesn't mean it's not true that we have to do that. You got to follow that. Or the problems exist that I just spoke about. You know, you could drop the wood. The sling could break and you could drop the wood. You could kill somebody. You know, and that's not a good thing. And then you can also get lawyers involved. And that's certainly not a good thing. Um, I wanted to take this particular comment a step further. And let me see if I did this slide. I did the slides right. Um, this is, Sarah, you may recognize this. Um, this is, uh, I just thought of that. Um, a typical basket in, a, in, a, in, a, in an arena rig, a, a, a hoist rig. And we're going to assume, for the sake of argument, that it's a one-ton hoist. This rig will always go up in the air with burlap, because that's what we do. Sometimes we put carpet up, but yeah, the lion's share of the time, there's a piece of burlap stuffed into the hook for us to, for the upriggers to place underneath the, um, uh, the steel sling, place it in between the sling and the I-beam to protect the steel sling in theory. Does anybody know what the compression factors are for burlap. What, what use, you know, what, what can we calculate to determine how well a piece of burlap is protecting um, the steel sling? You know, is there a formula? I'll wait. No, I won't. There is no formula. Nobody, nobody knows, you know, and the burlap is up there and is, you know, it's attempting to do a job. It's not the job that the burlap was designed for. You know, burlap was probably designed as a bag to hold potatoes uh, or onions or some other, you know, vegetable. Um, but we stick it up there to, in an effort to protect the, um, uh, the steel sling. It doesn't do a very good job. In fact, I would venture to say that it doesn't do a, a job at all. It, it's, it's not really worth the effort. That being said, however, I would never, ever, ever suggest that you don't put burlap or something underneath the, uh, the, uh, the sling because you'll get, you know, you'll, you'll hear about it and they'll yell at you and they'll make you take the point down and put burlap underneath it. But I think you need to understand that the reason we get to do that particular rig, that basket rig, has nothing to do with the burlap. What, the reason we get to do that is the rig is significantly over-designed and has significantly more capacity than what's going to be applied to it. This steel sling has a standard rating of 1.4 tons, and that's pull to pull when the sling is just stretched out, right? So if you were hanging that, that sling vertical, if it was hanging below the shackle down to the chain hoist, that sling, 3 8 diameter, seven by 19 IWRC wire rope. It has a, a working load limit of 1.4 tons. It has a breaking strength of 14,400 pounds. It's a one ton point. So we're hanging 2,000 pounds on it. In theory, we don't exceed 2,000 pounds in reality. We do pretty regularly, but we don't get too carried away with it. Maybe 22, 2,400 pounds on a one ton rig. This sling has a rating straight, as I said before, vertical of 1.4 tons. When you put it in a basket configuration, each leg of that sling has the same rating. So it's 1.4 ton capacity here, 1.4 ton capacity there. It's sharing the load. And considering the working load limit and the braking strength, um, then, you know, I'm sorry, I got distracted there for a second. Hang on one second. Um, okay, bye David. Um, Considering that we are sharing this load and that we're never going to put, let's say 20, more than 2,500 pounds on this rig overall, 
what happens up here is relatively inconsequential. But you need to be aware that sling manufacturers requ require padding. So you're gonna put padding here, but I want you to understand what's really going on here. I want you to understand the physics of what's happening here and the padding isn't doing a damn thing. The reason we get away with doing this is we don't put a significant load on that assembly. Okay, but keep, just keep in mind, no matter where you go, you're gonna need to, to uh, edge protect your, um, um, your slings. And most sling manufacturers do not consider uh, burlap to be edge protection. So we just did that. Oh, yeah, I threw this in here because it's, it's a question uh, that comes up all the time. Um, we'll, we're gonna come back to this. I got a couple of other things that I wanna make sure we hit here. So we wanna talk about standards. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, you know, we got rules, regulation, we got regulations, rules, and standards. Standards are provided by trade associations, um, whoop, by trade associations and other safety organizations. We already talked about the fact that they're voluntary versus the reality of maybe they're not so voluntary. Um, we're gonna have, I'm gonna be doing at the end of the month a, a significant, uh, a, 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 go into this in significantly more detail with standards. So I don't wanna steal all that thunder right now. I wanted to make you aware that the ESTA standards program, the technical standards program through ESTA has uh, a number of working groups that write standards. For our purposes, I wanted to just show you, and again, we're gonna go into this in detail at the end of October, um, some of the standards that have come out of the rigging working group, um, you know, all of them are important in their own way. And regretfully, if I had more time, I would get into a couple of them, but we don't. Um, but, you know, take a look at this list. Um, these documents are available from free, from free, listen to me, for free from ESTA. If you go to ESTA.org and go to the Technical Standards Program, you'll find their published documents and you can download them for free if you're not aware of them. And if you do things like hang loudspeakers on a regular basis, if you do, if you build temporary structures, um, you need to know what these standards uh, have. You know, you need to, to know what, they're, what, what the guidance that they provide. Right. And Mr. Paul Taylor has, um, thank you very much. He has jumped on that one. So I wanna move on here. I wanna talk about one particular standard that it dovetails into another situation that is a problem for us. And I think it's probably an okay way to finish up today. Um, this is the standard that the Rigging Working Group has written. Um, I can tell you that it is um, in the process of being revised. I'm on the committee that's revising it. Um, and then maybe by January, you'll have a new document. But for now, the 2015 iteration is the one. It's got a fancy name, but what it's really saying is, um, how do we protect people on a lighting truss in, you know, in a touring rig, in a show that's going to go up and, and, and come back down again? And, right. Okay, so the important thing for us today, number one is knowing that this standard exists. It provides guidance on how to put, primarily they talk about a horizontal lifeline on a truss. And as I think most of you know, when you put a horizontal lifeline on a truss, a chain hoist is typically involved in it, not necessarily as the ultimate anchorage point, but the lifeline will in some way run through the hardware that is hanging directly below the hoist. 
And the reason for that is because we need to get the horizontal lifeline up above the truss so that the technician is when they're walking the truss is not walking on top of the horizontal lifeline um, because that presents a, 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 a much greater fall distance and you don't want to get in that. You want the horizontal lifeline to be above you or at least, you know, even with your shoulders, you know, but preferably above your head. And a hoist is how we do that. I don't have a sketch for you because that's not the important part for today. The important part is to understand what the chain hoist manufacturer's policy is, what their rule is when you incorporate a fall arrest system into a Lodestar chain hoist or uh, a stage maker chain hoist. They both have very, very similar um, uh, rules about this. Um, Lodestar, their rule, their, you, know, I, you know, I checked in with, uh, with, with, with both of them at one point to see what their policy was. And Lodestar knew that I had this letter, and don't worry about trying to read it, I'm gonna give you an interpretation of it in a minute here, in a second. But, you know, what CM um, stated that they were still following the same policy that they had provided to the entertainment industry in 1996. Um, I also approached StageMaker and asked them what their policy was, and they said they didn't have one, and I gave them this letter. And then they came out with a policy that looks suspiciously like this letter. But so that's the, the, that's the original letter with Wally's signature on it and all that good stuff. And here's the basic interpretation of that letter. And I'll give you a minute to read it. Now, this is one of the drawbacks of doing a Zoom call. If I was doing this and we were all in the same room, I would be watching at least a fair number of you and as your eyes got wider and wider because this was a surprise to you. Basically what this is, what CM and StageMaker are saying that if you use one of their hoists in conjunction in any way with a fall rest system, and that includes running a line through a shackle that's hanging from the bottom hook of, uh, of the hoist, then you have to reduce the capacity of that hoist by 50%. So those one ton hoists that you just used to hang that 20 and a half inch box truss that is loaded to capacity, they're, not longer, they're no longer one ton hoists, they're half ton hoists. And if you don't, follow that and something goes south and there's a problem, um, you know, this is what you're going to run up against. Once again, this is where our industry needs, as a group and as individuals, we need to be better aware of what the regulations and what the rules are. Because you know, you got to follow them, or if you're not going to follow them, you got to make sure that you're taking the necessary steps to mitigate that problem. Does anybody want to, to, to offer an opinion on this or a suggestion maybe on how to resolve this problem? Knowing that for the most part, when you're, you're touring a show and somebody points out to you that in the two one tons that have a total of 4,000 pound capacity on that truss and you got 4,000 pounds worth of stuff hanging from it and then you just put, um, then you just put uh, um, uh, a horizontal lifeline on that truss, how do you resolve that? Jeff, you, Jeff, Jeff, Rusnak, did I pronounce that right? Um, you, you get, you win, you know, you beat Judy,
but Judy's right also. You put independent safeties on the, on the, uh, on the system. You back up the system, making sure that now the load capacity of the hoist, even though it's theoretically been reduced, you're now sharing the capacity, sharing the load with that secondary. It's not flapping in the breeze, but they are indeed sharing the load. And that's the best way to deal with that kind of a situation. Um, the, this, rec, this rule goes on to state that um, you need to monitor it visually or use load cells. I was impressed that in 1996 they were talking about load cells. Um, uh, you know, that's a more challenging situation. Um, I think, you know, I think monitoring visually is kind of a loose requirement because, you know, to me, when you monitor something, you're keeping an eye on it all the time. Um, that's really not, you know, not, not realistic here. But you've got to pay attention to it. It's got to be part of your inspection regimen. You know, every day when you come into the theater and you're doing your, your preliminary pre-show inspection or whatever, that's got to be a significant part of it. And you have to document it. Okay. All right. I have one more thing that I would like to show you. I know that we're just about out of time, but if I've done this properly, come on. Why is that not? Ah, there it is. One of the things that you're going to start seeing, and this goes back to the original conversation in the beginning of this class about how, you know, our, our requirements, our paperwork and our, our um, safety planning uh, requirements are going to increase um, because of the nature of the beast and they're being pushed by COVID-19 requirements. Uh, you're going to start seeing requests for risk assessment, analysis, and management. And I just wanted to toss this out here at the end of the class to, because people are really confused about the difference between risk assessment, risk analysis, and risk, risk management. And I've seen it in, in paperwork that I get from, you know, from potential clients, um, you know, or in paperwork that's being provided to a, a, a venue, uh, and they send it down to me for my opinion. Um, and they get really um, they get you know they get they get really you know kind of around the bend on this. Um, so I thought this was important. I don't know that there's a lot of conversation that we need to have about it, although I'm happy to discuss this because I'm throwing it at you at the last, at the end of the session here. Um, I wanna answer Owen's question about where you can find the table showing minimum bending radius for round slings. If you go to the Liftall catalog for Tough Flex, T-U-F-L-E-X, might be two Fs, but I think it's just one. Yeah. Um, Tough Flex round slings, they're synthetic slings. There is a table in there, and it was actually where I got wherever that table was. Is that where the table is? Ah, boy, there it is. So that's there, um, Sarah rebuilt the the table because I couldn't get it off the document but there that is why the come on my apologies but I'm having difficulty with my mouse right now all right we're back to here understanding and not only what these terms mean but how to use them properly not only satisfies a bunch of legal requirements that you're going to be running into, but also, you know, as we talked about with the other documentation, it's going to make you focus better. 
It's going to give you, it's another tool for you to use to make sure that what you are doing at that particular day on that particular site is appropriate and safe and that you know where the hazards are and how to mitigate, how to remove those hazards or at least respond to them should they rear their ugly little heads. And that, folks, brings us to the end, I think. Yes, it brings us to the end of, of today's fun and festivities. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, not only did this class go in a different direction than I had originally anticipated when I put it together, but as this class went along, it wandered off in, into a couple of other directions that I hadn't really anticipated, but I hope were helpful. Uh, as always, any questions, please feel free to, um, to send me a note. Um, you ETC folks, um, you should be in the habit of this by now. Send me uh, your name once again. I don't care if you sent it to me the last four times, send it again and uh, I'll make sure that your name gets uh, submitted for your recertification credits. All right, anything else? All right. Thank you all and uh, have a really nice Wednesday afternoon. And uh, wait, Ken, what's up? Yes. Canna points out that the German regulations, the DIN standards, require uh, a double break and a secondary safety. Um, they also require, if I'm not mistaken, Canna, they also require uh, a, six, a six pocket um, lifting wheel, chain wheel, um, whereas uh, stateside, it is a five pocket wheel. Uh, oh, Sarah, and Sarah has, uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for that. Um, the harness seminar is available on uh, Bill, I've muted you by accident. I was going to say, somebody muted me. Uh, <laughs> um, the, um, the, the first, the harness session is online now. You can get to it through the same page that you got, that you go to, to register. Uh, just scroll down a little bit. And tomorrow, the second seminar, which is the fly rail seminar, will be made available. I don't know, Sarah, do you know what time that is? Does that have a time? Sarah, I think you might still be muted. I have them scheduled for 9.45 on Fridays, so they okay. uh, each, each week in, in sequence. Right. So every once a week on Friday, 9.45 a.m. Eastern Time, the next, the, 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 the next seminar will be made available. The recording will be on, uh, uh, on YouTube. Sarah, Zach is asking about limited time. I can't, I don't think so, but I wanted you to, I wanted to be sure. Uh, they'll be, as far as I'm concerned, they'll be up indefinitely. So you tell me to take them down. Yeah. Until the 12th of never. Um, I've actually set up a whole uh, YouTube channel for all of these. So if you just bookmark the, the channel, you'll, you should get a notification if you subscribe. Ah, right, right. So Camille, to answer your question, next week's session, it'll be a couple of weeks. I'm, I, just, I don't remember the exact se sequence, but uh, it'll be a couple of weeks. Um, OSHA 30, ETCP, uh, somebody, uh, Tyler is asking for, uh, certification recommendations, ETCP, um, OSHA 30, and uh, lift certification, personnel lift, uh, MEWP.
James Lyle wants to know the channel. It should be Sapsis rigging, right? Yeah, if you look up Sapsis rigging, I'm trying to find the um, actual link for it right now, but uh, I can't find my own links. I can only find other people's. <laughs> okay. Then. Kana, take care. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. If that, if that is, if that's it, I'm going to. Uh, DP certified and are looking for a resource. Um, whoever is whoever that was, I didn't get all of your statement. Could you say it again? Somebody was asking about ETC, ETCP certification, but I, I just, that's all I heard. Yeah, not getting you. Um, send me an email or, um, yeah, send me an email with the question and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay. Thanks so much. Time to rock and roll. Okay. Do 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 do.